Hey, welcome back. In this lecture, we're going to be exploring uh, an algorithm named after Mr. Dijkstra, called Dijkstra's algorithm. And the algorithm that we're going to be looking at, the, the intent of it is going to be um, to find shortest paths in a graph. So let's go ahead and draw a graph. Of course, any graph will do, but this is a helpful example. So we have here vertex A and G and D and B and F and E. And let's say we have here five. These are going to be directed edges, so they have a definite source and a target, and we can't go the reverse direction. Let's say this is edge of weight three, and we'll make this a four and eight. We'll have an edge from B to C of weight 15. We'll have an edge from B to D of weight 3 and an edge from D to B of weight 2. We'll have an edge from D to F of weight 10 and E to F of weight 1. E to C of weight 2, B to E of weight 7, and say B to F of weight 4. So it's a pretty complicated graph, but um, it's not, not, not uh, too unwieldy. And then we've got some room here for a table that we'll draw a little bit later on. So that's a graph. And uh, what we're concerned about doing here is, is, let's say this is the model of seven different cities. And those numbers, be on the, the weights and the edges are perhaps the distance of, of, the, uh, of the distance that the road is between the cities. Or perhaps instead it's the expected number of hours of driving time. So maybe the roads are various distances, but maybe um, these two roads can be the same distance, but maybe this one has you know, lots of construction on it, or it's through the mountains or something. So whatever the, the situation is trying to model, it takes three somethings to get from A to B, whether that's a three-mile road or whether we're saying you know, the road is you know, heavy traffic or light traffic and it takes three hours to go from A to B. Whatever it is we're trying to model, the point is that's the weight on the edge. And when we deal with something like this, what we're trying to deal, uh, when we talk about uh, path lengths, our concern is in dealing with what we would call the uh, weighted path. And let me just kind of put this aside. That's going to be our final example graph, but there's also a, um, we talk about the path length. We'll do a simple example just for the moment, and then we'll go back to that final graph in a moment, or, or, or to kind of sum things up. We talk about a path length, and we had, for example, one in a tree where we said here we have a, you know, some sort of a tree of some kind, and we say the path length from the root down of this leaf was three. We had edge one, edge two, and edge three, and so the path length is three. And we could do that just as well in graphs if we wanted. And let's say we have here A and E and D, and then here we have, oh, say B and C and D. And I can say then, okay, I have different lengths of different paths. If I want to get to E, or if I want to start at A and go to D, the AED path has length 2. And the ABCD path has length 3. And so if I was concerned about the fastest way to get to D if we start at A, I would say, well, I would want to prefer to go through E, because that only takes two edges, and that takes three edges. And so in that case, the path length is smaller, going through E. When we deal with weighted graphs, though, generally when we talk about a weighted graph, we're generally discussing what is known as a weighted path length. And that's the idea that instead of the number of edges on the path, we add the sums of the weights on the path. So now let's come up here and let's draw, or let's draw the same graph. But now let's say here we have A to E is weight 10 and E to D is weight 10, and A to B is weight 5, and B to C is weight 5, and C to D is weight 5. Now we ask the same question on this weighted graph of with the exact same you know, structural layout. What's the shortest weighted path to D? And here the answer is to go from A to B to C to D rather than going A to E to D, because the AED path, the sum of those weights is 20 where the A, B, C, D path, some of those weights is 15. And so when we talk about a weighted path, we're not really concerned about the number of edges. 
Rather, we're concerned about the sum of the edges. And this could be a real-world situation, like I said, where perhaps this is a very nice, straightforward, easy route, and maybe this route goes up into the mountains and it's heavy traffic, and this route is heavy traffic coming down from the mountains. And so it may take 10 hours to go up to E and 10 hours to come down to D, where this would be 5 and 5 and 5. So that's a, certainly a possible situation in the real world, where you, know, you go through more cities, but you, know, you, have, you just happen to have more cities along that route, or you have you know, a, a, a nastier route to one city than to these others. And so um, in the real world, this kind of thing occurs a lot. Where we're not really concerned with, you know, um, we're concerned with the total distance from, say, going from Chicago to St. Louis or from Chicago to New York City. We're concerned about the total distance, not, you know, how many little road segments we ran into along the way. Where, you know, suddenly you, if you, you don't, suddenly if I decide to add a new city right here and say, okay, now that's two and that's three, that doesn't suddenly increase the time it takes to get from A to D. It just means, okay, now we've got four cities along the way instead of three, so therefore we have now four edges instead of three, but that doesn't change the fact that it takes 15 to get from A to D, 15 you know, miles or, or hours or whatever we happen to be representing. So the weighted path length is often a very useful thing in the real world, and so our concern is to find the shortest weighted path length. Now, when we talk about the shortest path, what we're concerned about is, well, I'd like to ultimately say maybe I'm trying to find the shortest path from A to D. Now, along the way, I will probably discover that the shortest path from A to E is 10 units, and the shortest path from A to B is 5 units, and then, you know, getting rid of that city we just added, ignore that for the moment. The shortest path from A to C is going to, um, is going to be 10 units, and the shortest path then from A to D, D is going to be 15 units. And so what we're dealing with there is the idea that as we're trying to discover one shortest path, what we might do along the way is manage to calculate some other shortest paths as well. Or maybe not. But generally, the algorithm we're referring to here is one where we say, firstly, we've got, it's called a single source shortest path meaning we're trying to find the shortest path from a particular source. I'm not trying to find the shortest path between all pairs. You know, I'm not saying how, what's the shortest path between A and D and the shortest path between B and E and the shortest path between C and A. I'm simply saying starting at A. We're always starting at A. What's the shortest path from A to each of the other vertices? And here I say from A to E the shortest path is 10. From A to B it's 5. From A to C it's 10. From A to D it's 15. And so that would, my, my, I hope my problem would discover that solution. When we talk about this, we, we are generally saying the general problem solves that, that general idea of saying, find the shortest path from A to each other individual vertex in the graph. Now, if we only wanted the shortest path to C, and we happen to have determined that that would be 10 before we managed to determine that the shortest path from A to D is 15, sure, we could stop the algorithm early. If we coded this up, we could say, well, once I've, I've established that I know for sure what the shortest path to a particular vertex is, if I have other shortest paths to other vertices to calculate, so what? I'm not concerned about those. I'll quit early. And you could certainly do that. So keep in mind as we talk about the algorithm, if you wanted something less than what the algorithm provides, you're free to stop early. What the algorithm will do, though, is find all the shortest paths, the shortest path from the source vertex to each of the other vertices individually. So um, we're not trying to find the shortest. We're not trying to find the shortest cycle around the whole graph or anything like that. We're simply saying what's the shortest for, for all all the other vertices that are not the source. What's the shortest path from the source to that vertex? Shortest path from the source to E, from the source to B, from the source to C, and from the source to D. Sorry, I keep hitting the paper. The shortest path from the source vertex to each of the other vertices individually is what we're after. So that said, there's a few issues to worry about. We'd like to say, oh, just traverse down the graph like I did here. And I say, well, look, you know, B is, is 5, um, and, and to C is, is then you add 5 to get 10, and to D you add 5 and get 15, and oh, that looks really easy. But the problem is that even in this graph, there's going to be some conflict here between the AED path and the ABCD path. We say this path is 20 and this one's 15, and we need to decide between them somehow. And the way to do this is not to do a brute force uh, search. We certainly could do that if we wanted to. We could say, well, let's find every conceivable path from A to D. 
And in this case, there's, there's only two. But in a more complicated graph, there would certainly be many. And we can say, let's find every conceivable path from A to D and then figure out which one's the best. And that would be like saying, well, I want to find out the fastest way to New York. Let's find the fastest possible way, or I'm sorry, let's find every possible way to get to New York from Chicago. And so I might say, well, here's Chicago. And maybe there's a bunch of different ways to get from Chicago to Columbus, Ohio. And then maybe from there, there's a bunch of different ways to get from Columbus, Ohio to New York City. And so, oh, let's say, what the heck, maybe there's 18 ways to get from Chicago to Columbus and 18 ways to get from Columbus to New York. Now that's 324 different paths that we're worried about, at least there. When in reality, what if I knew this was the shortest path from Chicago to Columbus? Why would I bother looking at combinations of saying Chicago to Columbus, you know, I could have taken this path and then gone here, or I could have taken this path and then gone here, or this path and then gone here. If I'm going to sort of make paths out of Chicago to Columbus, Columbus to New York, why on earth would I take any of the slower paths when I could have taken the fastest one? And likewise, here, why on earth would I have said, oh, if this is the fastest one, and then I could, let's say this is the fastest path from Columbus to New York City, why would you say, well, let's look at here and then this, and let's look at here and then this, and let's look at here and then this, if we happen to know this was the fastest path from Columbus to New York City, and this was the fastest path from Chicago to Columbus, why would we look at all the other combinations of paths? Now, we may not know one or the other, but the point here would be that it's not going to be really worth our time to find all possible paths, because we might know at some point, maybe we've been able to figure out earlier, this is the shortest path from Chicago to Columbus. Given that, then, if we consider taking this path to Columbus and then all of these, that's only 18 different paths. One path to Columbus times 18 different ones to New York City, as opposed to 18 different paths to Columbus times 18 different paths to New York City. And that's all you'd have to do there is, whatever calculation time it takes to figure out the shortest route from Chicago to Columbus, then we can, once we know that shortest route, we discard all the others. Why take a long route to Columbus and then go to New York, when you can take a short route to Columbus and then go to New York? So if we were able to figure out that shortest path from Chicago to Columbus faster than we could compare all 324 paths, then certainly finding that shortest path to Columbus first and then worrying about going to New York is going to be better than saying, well, I've got 18 different paths and let me then proceed from all of those. Let's consider each one of those. Let's take, go to Columbus using that path and then from Columbus the 18 different ways to New York City. That sort of brute force search of all the paths is going to be very time consuming when in reality, if we somehow were able to quickly find the best path to, you know, kind of a, a, a halfway point or whatever, then that would help us out and it would eliminate the need to compare this bad path to one of these. So the brute force search is not going to be an appealing solution for us. Instead, we're going to want to sort of develop our solution as we go rather than saying, let's find every possible path and then, you know, add up all the path lengths of each and then compare them to see which one is smallest. That's sort of a brute force approach and it's going to be very inefficient compared to some, some, kind, of, um, some kind of algorithm that would perhaps find the shortest path to Columbus and then we'd make use of that and ignore the rest of the paths from Chicago to Columbus. So, given that, we have two issues we need to worry about. That's, that's why we wouldn't go forward with the brute force approach. And the first issue we need to worry about is updating. And we've already seen kind of an example of that in the conflict between the, the lane 15 and the lane 20 path, path on the previous graph. Um, we can sort of look at it in a graph like this too. Let's say we have here 10 and B, here's 5, C and D. And we'll also say we've got here now when we're doing this when we're going to solve this problem, these edges don't need to be directed, though commonly they will be. Um, so let's say we have that graph. And now I say, well, A is my source. So I explore from A to the other um, nodes. And let's say I look at B and I say, hey, I can get from A to B in length 5 and I can get from A to E in length 10. 
And so now I've got those two, and maybe I look at B next now. And I say, well, look, I can get from B to E in a smaller path than before. That is, the A to E path is only one edge, but it's at an edge of weight 10. The A, B, E path takes two edges, but total they add up to less. So what we might want to do here, in fact, what we definitely want to do is do an update. I want to be able to say, look, I found a better path. The A to E path is of weight 10. The A to B to E path gets to E in faster time than the old path, and so I want to be able to do an update. Because as we traverse around the graph, just as we saw here, we may indeed find a better path than the one we saw earlier. And similarly now, we may say, well, hey, I can get now I can get to C in 10, and I can get to here in 8. And now we might proceed from E, and we may say, well, now that means I can get to D in 18. And then I proceed from C and say, well, wait a minute. The A, B, E, D path was 18. The A, B, C, D path is going to be 15. So we'd say, well, hey, I have certain 18 here. 10 plus 5 is 15. I should do another update. So here's another example where I said I found an old path that was 18, and now this path was 15, and that's even better. So as we run this algorithm, as we traverse over the graph, there will be a number of times where one, however we have, whatever order we happen to be exploring from the vertices in, one of the vertices, as we explore from it, we end up setting a path value that then later on we find some better path and we want to update. So our algorithm needs to have the facility to say, I've now reached this vertex from a different way than I did before. Which way is faster? And then you should store the appropriate shortest distance. So we need to be able to do that. We need to be able to have this facility built in to say, wait, you know, this path's better than this one. This path's better than this one. And it may not have been. Maybe this had been, you know, you know, 20 instead of 5. And so then if this was 20 instead of 5, then that would have been 10 plus 20 is 30, which, it, which would have been much worse than 18. And we wouldn't have updated. We would have said the A, B, E, D path is 18. The A, B, C, D path is 30. And 18 is better. So we would have kept 18. It was possible that we wouldn't update either, but we should at least look. We should at least say, here's a new path. Is it better or worse than the old one? Store the best one of the two. The other issue is, which vertex do we traverse from first? Certainly here in this graph, I explored from the, from the source. And then I said, well, now that I've looked at B and E, which one do I look at next? And I could say, well, I looked at B next. And then after that, I looked at E, and then I looked at C. And the question is, well, how do we pick, this, how do we pick what vertex to, to work next? And an example of the problems that can arise if we pick wrong are as follows. Here's another graph. So the question here is, which vertex do we explore next? So let's have a graph here where here is A. And here is going to be vertex F. We'll have a weight length 7F and an edge of weight 6 to C, and an edge of weight 15 from A to C, an edge of weight 4 from C to D, an edge of weight 5 from A to B, an edge of weight 10 from A to E, edge of weight 3 from B to E, and finally an edge of weight 10 from E to D. Let's start looking at, at how we proceed here. Let's say, well, A is our source again, as before. And so from A, we start traversing over the entire graph. And I say, well, from A, look at all the neighbors of A that I can reach. So A, of course, is distance 0. And so I say, hey, I can reach E in a total of 10. And I can reach B in a total of 5. And I can reach C in a total of 15. And I can reach F in a total of 7. And maybe we say, well, I, I, I uh, saw E first. You know, maybe the order these were listed on in your adjacency list implementation, you had your array cell here, and you said, well, these are listed in the order E, C, B, and F. And so maybe that's the order you looked at them, and you said you made E 10, and then you said C was 15, and B was 5, and F was 7. And now you're going to explore those vertices in that same order. Let's explore E. There's a difference between reaching a vertex and exploring one. 
Here we've just reached each of these so far. I've, I've, I've set the, the distance. I've said, well, here's the best distance, best, best distance I know of so far. And so I don't have to do anything now. I, I've got a best distance so far. But now with E, I need to now say, well, now what can I reach from E? And, and look at all those edges. And that's different. There's a difference between simply saying, well, I haven't explored E as a source for a text. I simply said, what is E a target of? What's the, you know, updating the shortest path to E, but now I'm, when I look at what we can reach from E, now that shortest path value matters, because now I say, well, 10 plus 10 is 20, and so I can reach D in length 20. And then explore C, and I say, well, wait a minute, C was 15, 15 plus 4 is 19. So I had the A, E, D path, and the A, C, D path, this was 20, the ACT path is 19, and that's better. So let's update this to 19. And now I look at B, and I say, well, from B we have 5 plus 3 is 8, and that updates this to 8. Okay, now we looked at all the neighbors of B. The problem is, since we updated E, but we had processed E already, we now need to explore E further because these calculations were based on wrong values. So I say, oh, wait a minute, E's been corrected. Let's go back and look at E's stuff again. And we say, well, now if E was 8, 8 plus 10 is 18. So if I say, well, now we have the A, B, E, D path, that's 18, and that's better than 19. So we update that again. And finally, I look at F, and I say, well, F has a neighbor, C, so 7 plus 6 is 13. That's better than 15, so I update that. Oh, but wait a minute. We had process C earlier. Now C's value is better than it was before. So let's look at that again. 13 plus 4 means we have the A, F, C, D path is 17. And so we update D yet again. Now the updating D isn't the problem. The problem is... We're not really coming at D from new directions in those last two um, updates. The issue is one of saying, well, you know, maybe I, I, I have been trying to find ways to go from Columbus to New York, and I've been basing these calculations off those ways. Suddenly I find out, oh, wait a minute, there's a shortcut I could have taken to get to Columbus in the first place, which means all the things I calculated from Columbus to New York were wrong because they were based on a wrong value to get to Columbus. And that's the same thing as here. From E, I was basing decisions on D. I had said here the ACD path was better than the AED path because I thought this is the fastest way I could get to D through E. And they said, oh, wait a minute. I could have actually gotten to, I could have actually followed this edge to D and gotten there faster because the distance from E was wrong. Once they update the distance for, to E to 8, that changes this from 20 to 18, so now this was really better than the ACD path. And if the graph, if that had been it, then we did that update. And then we said, oh, wait a minute, well, this edge had been wrong too, because, wait a minute, we could have gotten a C faster than we initially thought, so let's compare the path through this edge to the path through this edge again, and now that updates to 17. So we only have two edges into D, and yet we've done three different path comparisons, 20 to 19, 19 to 18, and 18 to 17. And if we had further updates to E or further updates to C, we'd have to do this all again. And worse still, if before we had done any processing on C, we had explored from D and made calculations off of that to other nodes, now this constant correction of D means those have to be constantly corrected as well. And we'd like to avoid that sort of thing. I mean, certainly we could do these updates over and over and over again, but that's going to chew up a lot of time. What we'd like to do instead is be saying, well, there's a path I can reach to D through C. Just like I can say, I can get to New York from Columbus, certainly. But let's, if I'm trying to go from Chicago to New York through Columbus, let's first figure out the best path from Chicago to Columbus. Going back to the earlier diagram, let's not say, oh, I could take this path to Columbus and then figure out what the best way to Columbus to New York is, or we know varying ways of Columbus to New York, and then say, oh, wait a minute, I really could have taken this way, that's even better. So all those calculations I did changed those.
because now we have new shortest paths. Because, you know, we might not just be comparing through Columbus. We might be comparing those paths to, you know, other paths that don't go through the Columbus as well. And maybe I say, well, you know, I, I could have gone, to, I, I'm taking this way to Columbus and then this way to New York City. And, you know, that's going to be longer than doing it this way, going through Missouri or whatever. So I don't want to, I'd rather take the Missouri route or the Kentucky route. And I say, oh, wait a minute, but if I do this, go this way to Columbus and then this way to New York City, that's better than this route. But I, wouldn't, I didn't know that at first because I missed this short cut originally. And I had thought this was the best way to get to New York City so far, and then I realized, oh, wait, if I ditch this path and take this one instead, that means this path is faster than this one, and that means not only is it faster, but it turns out even though this path was slower than this one, this path is faster than this one. And so now we do an update. And that tends to be a pain. When we have to go back and update earlier parts of the path, like we did here and like we did here, and then do recalculations based on those earlier parts being improved, those recalculations chew up a lot of time we'd rather not chew up. So what we'd like to say is, before I start trying to proceed from C and make calculations there, I'd like to know for sure I've got the best path to C. Before I start trying to base calculations off of E, I'd like to know for sure I've got the best path to E. Rather than just basing calculations to E on our whim and then having to go back and update that, the E later on, and therefore update the calculations, and likewise, we don't want to say, well, let's base calculations off of C at our whim and then have to update C later on and therefore update those calculations that we made off of C. The question is, if we want to avoid that, what do we do? What order might we explore the vertices to avoid that problem? Or is there no answer to that question? And if you want, I'll, you can pause, the, pause it and think about it for a moment. And now I'll, I'll sort of put a pause in, in the lecture here and then come back and answer that question. So is there some order of the vertices that we could proceed with so that that wouldn't be a problem? And the answer to that question is, yes, there is such an order. And the order is, always start with the lowest distance vertex. Again, there's a difference here between updating the shortest path to a vertex and exploring from that vertex. And here, all along, we are only updating the shortest path we had reached from D so far. That's an entirely different issue from then saying, well, what is D the source of? And let's look at those vertices we can reach from D. I can update this value at D all day. As long as I haven't built calculations from D, nothing gets affected. What I'd like to do is say, I'm not going to explore from D and make calculations to other nodes until I know for sure what I have at D is the lowest possible value that I would take to reach D. And likewise here, I say, well, I don't want to base calculations off of E until I know E is the, at the best it will be. I don't want to base calculations off of C until I know C is the best it could be. But firstly, let's draw that distinction. The difference between continually visiting a node and saying, oh, this is the better path. Oh, this is a better path still. Oh, this is a better path still. And then when we know for sure we've got the best path, then we proceed to visit from that node to other nodes. Not going to that node repeatedly, like we kept going to D over and over again, but then saying from D we explore. Or we go to E two different ways, and when we know we got the best way, from E we explore. And now let's consider here the initial situation we had. I'm going to draw that same graph again, but we'll start over. Here's our source, A, and we had F here is 7 and C is 6. Whoops, this is 6, this is C. This was 15, this is 10, this is 5. E, this is 3, this is 10, and this is 4 to D, right to 10 here. So that was our, the original graph. And when I explored from A, I said, well, I can reach this in length 7, I can reach this in length 15, I can reach this in length 5, and I can re reach this in length 10. And now, Consider B. 
before we started proceeding from E right away, and then we had to update E later on. And the reason that was possible was because, well, we had this path length of 5 to B, and so because we could reach B in far less than we could reach E, there's this potential that B plus some B to E edge, the distance to B plus the cost of the edge from B to E turned out to be less than the distance we had previously recorded to E. Likewise, over here, when we did that update, it was because the distance to, to F plus the cost of the edge from F to C turned out to be less than the cost, which is 15, that we had at that point recorded at C. Now consider B for a minute. Could that be the case for anything in this graph? Could it be the case that the distance to something plus the cost from that something to B will be less than the cost or less than the distance to B? And the answer is it's impossible. Because we only have four places to build off of. From the source, we've explored E, B, C, and F. Any other path, any path we ever end up with in this graph is going to start AE, or it will start AB, or it will start AC, or it will start AF. Because they all have to start with A, and there are no other edges A, A, A points to. We've looked at all the edges that, that depart from A. So any path we'll ever describe in this graph starts AF, AC, AB, or AE. And the AF path is already 7, and the AC path is already 15, and the AE path is already 10. There's no way that I can have a path that starts at E that eventually winds its way back to B, that'll be less than 5 if we have only positive edges. Because the path length is already 10. 10 plus anything is going to be greater than 5. 15 plus anything is going to be greater than 5. 7 plus anything will be greater than 5. These paths are already bigger than B. So there's no way that we can add on to these paths, eventually reaching B from them and B less than what's at B. They're already too big let alone adding more edges to them. In fact, even if the edges were zero, even if I could magically teleport from C to B, we walk 15 miles, we get to the teleport station, and pow, we're right at B, and distance zero. The A to C path was so long that even if we can instantly transport ourselves from C to B, the path from A to B is still better. 15 plus even zero don't even add 1 or 2 to 15. 15 plus 0 is still greater than 5. Well, as long as I don't have negative edges, and indeed the algorithm we're about to describe is going to collapse and not work if we have negative edges. Now, there are some applications that have negative edges. If you're modeling road networks, of course, you won't, you know, there's no such thing as negative distance for a road. But there are applications where your edges could be negative. We're going to assume that's not the case here. If your edges are 0 or greater weight, then if I start proceeding, start exploring from the minimum vertex, the minimum distance vertex out of, the, out of the, the proposed distances I have so far, I know for sure A is 0 because that's my source. Now I say, well, this is 7, but it might be updated. This is 15, but maybe it'll be updated. This is 5, but maybe it'll be updated. And E is 10, but maybe it'll be updated. We only know about the, those are, we only know those are possible distances. Any of them might be updated. Then we look at B and we say, well, you know, B is the minimum out of those distances. Everything else is greater than B already. So there's no way B could be updated. You can't get better than 5 because everything else is already greater than 5. And if you leave those vertices and say, well, here's a path length that's 7 so far, and if I keep adding to it, eventually I'll get to B in less than 5. That can't happen. It's already 7. Same thing here. 10 plus anything will never be less than 5. 15 plus anything will never be less than 5. So it is impossible in this graph to ever beat the path we've already got to beat. And the reason we know that is, out of all these sort of path stubs we've got so far, the paths we have, the four way vertices we have to build paths off of at this point, and there's no other ways we could start a path. There is no A anything else. We've looked at all the edges from A. So right now, those are the only four vertices to build paths from. And all the ones that are not B are already greater than, takes longer than five to get there. 
takes longer than 5 to get to E, longer than 5 to get to C, longer than 5 to get to F. So since this distance is the minimum proposed distance out of all the vertices that, we, that are, that are you know, still, still up for contention, we therefore know that this is not only the minimum, the, the, the proposed distance for B, but this is set in stone. We know for sure there is no way to get to B in better than 5. And now that stops becoming a proposed distance and becomes a definite distance. Because we know it can't be beaten. It's the minimum out of all our existing distances. All the other paths are already out of all, I'm sorry, it's the minimum out of all the proposed distances of vertices we're still building. Of course it takes 0 to get to A. But we've already explored from A. Out of all the vertices whose distances are still up for contention, B is the minimum one. And so it can't be beaten. Because there isn't going to be some other path out of the blue. Any path we might reach that, that isn't the A, B path we have already is going to be A, E, something, something, B, or A, C, blah, 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 B, or A, F, blah, 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 B. Or even A, B, blah, 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 B. You know, you could point that to yourself, but, you know, go ahead and throw zero and add zero on there. You're still five. You don't beat it. So... The shortest path from A to B is 5. At this point, there's no doubt. So now there's no, no doubt, it's okay to solidify B, set it in stone, and then say, explore from B. Now we're done trying to update B's path. Now that we know it's definite, we can explore from B and say, well, look, 5 plus 3 is 8, and that's better than 10. And there's our update that we talked about before. And now that we've set B in stone and we've explored from B, now let's look at all the vertices again. And I say, here I've got 8 and 15 and 7. 7 is the lowest one. I have already explored every possible edge from B. There's not going to be any new A, B, whatever paths out of that come out of the blue. Every path is going to end. I've, every path now definitely has E in it or C in it or F in it. They may have B as well, but all paths now, we, we don't have anywhere else to build off of B. Any new paths we build off of B necessarily go through E as well. You know, okay, we've got, we know the shortest distance to B is 5, but now we say any new paths that have B in them, you know, if we're going to talk about the path to D through B or the path to C through B or the path to F through B, they're going through one of the vertices we've explored from B, namely E in this case. So there is no A, B, D. There's no magical edge that's going to appear out of nowhere. We've done our exploring from B, and now those are proposed distances. And so there's no way to beat the distance to F. Because the A to C, this path to C is already too big. The path to E is already too big. We've already looked at all the possible paths from A. And we've already looked at all the possible edges from B. So there's no way to beat the A to, with the distance recorded there now. And so that's set in stone. And now I can explore from F and say, well, this isn't 15. This is 13. And now I look at the, them again, and I say, well, E is 8, and C is 13. I know I can't beat the value of path length 8 to E, because I've already explored all the ways I can go somewhere from B. I've already explored all the ways I can go somewhere from F, and I've already explored all the ways I can go somewhere from A. And I have not explored from E or C yet, but of course E is 8, so you, know, you, you can't get to E. You, you, we don't have negative loops, so we can keep, you know, going from E to E to E to E and lowering that number. And likewise, C is already greater than 8, so there's no way to go from C eventually make its way to E and say, well, now we've beaten 8, we're already bigger than 8. So I know this is, cannot be improved, and so I can say, well, now that that's locked in place, now we can explore the E to D edge, and that turns out to be 18. And now between 13 and 18, that's the lowest, 13 plus 4 is 17, and we've only done one comparison there, not three. Or I looked at two possible paths. I followed this edge into D and followed this edge into D, which is what I want. I didn't have to then go back and follow this one again and follow that one again. I followed each edge into a vertex only once. And if I can ensure that that happens, and this indeed will, then my algorithm will run quicker because I'll only have to kind of look at each edge once. I won't need to look at each edge over and over again by updating earlier edges. So the solution here is to say, what we will do with each step is say, out of all the vertices that have you know, these proposed distances, the lowest proposed distance can't be beaten anymore, because all the other distances are greater. 
So that vertex now stops being a proposed distance and becomes the actual definite shortest distance of that vertex. And then we can explore from it rather than just updating its distance. And at each step, we'll, we'll take the existing collection of proposed distances, so mark in stone the vertex that has the lowest proposed distance, and then we will explore from that vertex. And that's Dijkstra's algorithm. You want to write this down because I'm going to need to show the, that, that graph I put up at the start of class. I'm going to need to show that next. Oh, well, we can say initially all distances all distances are infinity all it flags which we'll call known are zero. So initially, we'll sort of say, well, what's the distance to any vertex? Well, we haven't seen any vertices yet. We haven't started processing. So all the distances are, are infinity. We haven't, we, we don't even know if we can reach the vertex at all. You know, so if I had some sort of, that's a reasonable thing to end that too. If I come back here and say, hey, here's vertex G all by its lonesome. Well, that distance would have started out at infinity. And indeed, it would have ended at infinity too, because we can't reach it. So in a sense, the shortest distance from A to G is infinity. We can never get from A to G. It'll take forever because there's no edge to it. So we'll start out, every vertex will be infinity. And as we see them one by one, if I can reach a vertex, by definition, that means there's some non-infinity path from A to that vertex. So you know, eventually, I reached D. And it was 18 to begin with, but it did mean that as soon as I saw D, it meant I had found some path to D from A, where I'll never be able to reach G. So that stays at infinity. And then these definite flags are the ones where we're saying, is the distance recorded at this vertex definite, set in stone, or is it simply the proposed distance, but we're not sure if it's definite yet. And as soon as it becomes definite, we will um, mark, change that flag to one and say, now this vertex is definite. That, that's the shortest path for sure. And we're going to, so we don't have a distance in D, both start with, distance and definite both start with D. So we'll call this known instead of definite. We know it's the shortest path instead of just thinking it might be. And so that's when, when that flag changes to one, then the vertex is known. It, the, the path there is definite. And then once that's done, set source distance to zero from infinity. Because of course, we now that's the last piece of initialization. We know we can reach the source in faster time than, than infinity. We're right there. That's our source. So the distance of that is zero, of course. That's our initialization. And so we can sort of come to this graph, the initial graph we talked about, and say, well, let's sort of put that in a table. And I'll say I have here my vertex and the distance of that vertex and the known flag for that vertex. And I can say here, well, my vertices are A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. And initially, they are all infinity. And initially, these are all zero. I don't, none of these distances are definite yet. And then we'll say, oh, by the way, we're going to have A as our source. So we'll say, by the way, the source distance, of course, should be zero and not infinity. And then we can say, with Dijkstra's algorithm, once the, once the initialization part is done, then here's our processing. Say loop, and the loop's going to go v times, where v is the number of vertices. And in each step in this loop, we'll pick out a vertex. We say here, pick the kv equals 0 vertex with minimum dv. What we're saying is, out of the vertices that are marked 0 for unknown, we're not going to keep processing the same vertex over and over and over again. So we don't want to say just pick out the vertex with the minimum distance. We'd always be picking the source. Nothing's going to have distance 0 other than the source. 
So we keep picking the source, and we just said, pick the vertex with the minimum distance. We're going to pick the vertex that has not been set in stone yet, because the others we know have minimum distances. Now we're saying, out of the remaining vertices that we're not sure about yet, the minimum of those now is going to be the one we set in stone on this step. So pick the vertex that is not definite or unknown, and out of those vertices, the one with the lowest distance. We'll call it V. Arc V known, so now it's KV flag changes to 1. And then we'll say, here's our update step. For all neighbors W of V, if the distance at W is greater than the distance to this new vertex V plus the cost from that vertex to W, then we will update. So if the old path that was recorded there already is greater than the new path we found that goes to the vertex I'm at and then to W from there, then we'll say that, okay, then the, the distance I should record at, at W is equal to this new path. And of course, there's implicit else do nothing there. So if that means if this was greater, if the new path was greater than the old one, then you wouldn't do any updating. But this is the old path, and now we're saying, well, now I'm at this vertex V, and hey, I can reach W from this vertex too. Is this path better than the old one that was recorded? And if so, then this new distance should be recorded instead of the old one. And so this idea of picking the minimum DV is how we make sure the vertices are done in the proper order. And then here's our update step. And that's all there is to it. We loop through this V times. One by one, we'll pick out each vertex, and we'll be done. So coming to here, now that we've done with the initialization, step one says, out of all the vertices, this should have been V, not N. Out of all the vertices where KV equals zero, and of course, this is the first step right now, so KV is zero for all of them, what we want here to do is to pick the vertex out of all of those with the lowest KV. And you're going to have to pardon me for a moment while I change the microphone in the battery, or change the battery in the microphone, rather. Give me 10 seconds. OK, we're back. So we have here the idea of the KV. And they're all, the KV flag is zero for all the vertices, because we're at step one. And so we say, well, the lowest distance is A, which has distance zero. And so I will, the, the algorithm says, we pick vertex A, and we'll always pick the source the first time. Mark it known, so we change that to one. And then for all the neighbors W of A, in other words, for all the vertices we can reach from A, all the vertices, which here are B and D, the targets of the departing edges of A. Those are the neighbors of A. For all the neighbors of that vertex, see if the new path is worse than the old, the, the old path is worse than the new path. If the old path is worse than the new path, then save the new path instead. And so we say here, this is zero. We know that distance is set in stone. Actually, I'm going to go ahead and use a different color for this. This is zero. That's set in stone. Is 0 plus 3 better than what's at B now, which is infinity? Oh, of course. So we can go ahead and store a 3 there. Is 0 plus 5 better than what's at D now, which is infinity? And yes, it is. So we go ahead and store a 5 there. Now we have two proposed distances. Every single path we'd ever find in this, in this graph now is going to start AB or AD. Because it has to start at A, and there's no other path. So I know those are the only two vertices I can build paths off of. And so if I was to start processing at D, there's a risk now that this edge could have been, say, 1 instead of 3. And I'd say later on, 3 plus 1 is 4, which is less than 5. And I'd build processing off of D, and I'd say, oh, wait a minute. D shouldn't have been 5, because I can reach it in path 4 if I go through B. That's, like I said, if that edge had been 1 instead of 3. So that's why I don't want to do that. I don't want to update after I've started processing off a of vertex. So instead, I pick the minimum one. Out of these two and all the other four, which are infinity, I'm saying now at the start of the second step, 
I say, because I've finished with the first step, I've now looked at the neighbors of A and updated them if appropriate. And in both cases, it was appropriate. So now I say, out of, out of the re remaining and step in the first, second pass through the loop, out of the vertices that still have kv equals 0, what's the minimum distance? And that's b. And so now I know for sure b is set in stone. Yes, there is an edge from d to b. So I could have gone, you know, given this path to d, I could have then proceeded to b from there. But even if this 2 is a 0, that path still doesn't beat the 1 to b from before. Because we started out greater than 3, so 5 plus anything won't be greater than 3. Or won't be better than 3. So it's safe to say, well, since this is the minimum path, I can set that in stone. And now we explore from there, because we said, well, once we've found the kv equals 0 vertex with the minimum dv, and out of b, c, d, e, f, and g, vertex b had the minimum dv, now we mark it known. And for all the neighbors w of that vertex, update the paths if necessary. So I say I have five neighbors, d, f, e, c, and g. Is 3, here's my current distance, the d, w, the current distance at g, is infinity. And we say d, v, well, my vertex v is where I am now, b. Is the distance to b plus the edge from b to g, which is 7, that sum, is that better than infinity? Well, yeah, of course. So, yes, I update that, and that infinity should now be a 7. Is 3 plus 15 better than infinity? Yes. So this is now proposed 18. Is 3 plus 7 better than infinity? Yes. So that's proposed 10. Is 3 plus 4 better than infinity? Yes. So that's proposed to be 7. Is 3 plus 3 better than 5? Is 6 better than 5? No. So there's no need to update the path to D. The path that we found from A to D has a lower cost than the A, B, D path. The A, B, D path has cost 3 plus 3 or 6. The A, D path directly just has cost 5. So we, don't, we did an update for those four vertices. We don't do an update here. And now we're done. Step 3, the same thing. Out of the remaining vertices that are still kv equals 0, they're still unknown, that are not set in stone yet, which is the minimum? The minimum is d. So now that's set in stone. We know since all the other paths are already greater than 5, that there's no way any of them could eventually reach d in less than 5. So we're, we're OK there. So that said, mark that known, and explore the neighbors of d. One of the neighbors is b, and 5 plus 2 is not less than 3, so we don't do an update there. And here, 5 plus 10 is not less than 7, so we don't do an update there. So we had two possible new paths to explore from D, but neither of them resulted in an update. End of step three. Step four, out of the vertices that are still kv equals zero, what's the minimum? And we have a tie between vertex f and vertex g. And when we have a tie, it doesn't really matter which one goes first. Pick either one. So what we'll do is we'll pick vertex f, because, hey, why not? And so we'll say, well, f is set in stone. There are other paths that tie it in length. But then, since we don't have negative edges, the, if we had an edge from g to f, that had weight 0. If we could teleport from g to f in the real world, we still can't beat f in path length 7. If you and I start walking, we both walk to b. And now you start walking to g, while I start walking to f. If you can teleport to f the instant you hit g, we're still going to arrive at f at the same time. You can't beat me, because it takes you so long to get to the teleport station that I'm at f by the time you reach the teleport station, even if you instantly zap over to f. You still need four more feet, four more miles, whatever, to get there. And in that time, I've walked the same four miles and gotten f. So the tie doesn't matter. It just means you have, you know, if you had a zero weight edge from z, g to f, it just means that would be a different path to get to f it wouldn't be any better. It would just be a different one. So that said, there are no neighbors from f. f only has entering edges, so there's nothing to look at from f. End of step four. Loop pass number five. Out of 18, 10, and 7, which is the lowest? Well, it's g, 7. So now this is set in stone. 
because there's no way to start at 10 and reach g in less than 7. There's no way to start at 18 and reach g in less than 7. So g is set in stone. We have two neighbors. 7 plus 5 is not better than 0, but 7 plus 8 is better than 18. So at c here, I update this to 15 because I found a better path. The path that was there, dw, is greater than dv plus the cost from v to w. And that's it for g. We should have marked that known as well. And we should have marked that known. Sorry, I didn't do that. I did a square here, but that, those should have been marked known as well. End of step five. Step six, we're looking between 15 and 10. And 10 is the minimum, so we mark that known. Or in other words, that's set in stone. 10 plus 1 is not better than 7. But 10 plus 2 is better than 15. So we do another update at C and say the path to E so far plus the path to C through E, that total is less than however we got to C up to this point. And so C gets updated yet again. And then finally in step 7, we mark C known and that's set in stone. And there you go. And if you look through the graph to your heart's content, you will see that those indeed are the shortest paths. And as we found these shortest paths, we could have been keeping track of that, but we'll discuss that a little bit in the implementation lecture. The point is we have the shortest paths here. The shortest path to B is 3, and that happens to be the AB edge. The shortest path to D is 5. The shortest path to F was 7. The shortest path to E was 10, which we had found by taking that path. The shortest path to G turned out to be 7, which we found by doing that. And the shortest path to C turned out to be 12. We first thought, hey, the 315 path was best, A, B, C. And we said, oh, wait a minute, the 348 path, A, B, G, C, was better than that. And then we found out that, oh, wait a minute, the 372 path, the A, B, E, C path, was better, to, better still. So I only needed to explore each edge once. This edge led me to the 18 path. And then I came in through this edge and said, I've got an even better path. And then it came in through this edge and said, I've got a better one still. But there were only two updates to do because there were only, or three updates because there were only three total edges. We started at infinity, updated to 18, and then to 15, and then to 12. We didn't need to keep updating 18 times to the same edge because the earlier stuff kept getting changed. When I explored from B to C, I knew B could not be improved on. When I explored from G to C, I knew G could not be improved on. And when I explored from E to C, I knew E could not be improved on. And that's the idea. That's Dijkstra's algorithm. Now, this happens to turn out, I'm just going to kind of throw this out right now. We'll, we'll explain why this is the case later on. Um, but if you're curious at the moment, v plus e times the quantity log v would be the running time for sparse graphs. So it actually isn't too expensive at all. Um, but we will explain why when we talk about the implementation in a lecture or two. Um, but as far as the procedure itself, that's how the algorithm works. And then in that future lecture, we will discuss how we would go about implementing this with the data structure we've studied so that we can get that running time. And that's it. Um, we will see you next time when we start discussing uh, minimum spanning trees. See you then. Take care.